What is cloud computing and why is it so important for us to know about it? Well, it might help to understand cloud computing by putting it into historical context. Let's take a look at why cloud computing is considered the third wave of computation and what were the first two. The first one was mainframes. We had a mainframe computer or a mini computer depending on the size of your organization and all of the processing and storage took place on that mainframe system. We accessed that mainframe through dumb terminals that could pass text into the mainframe and receive video output from the mainframe in order to do our work. Now, the good news about this was that the mainframe could distribute resources to many, many users, and if a user wasn't using their terminal, then those resources could be given to a different user in a shared system. Now, of course, the downside of the mainframe is that those dumb terminals had to be located fairly close to the mainframe, and what that meant is that we had a computing center, and to do any work, we had to go to the computing center. That evolved over time, and we had mainframes talking to other mainframes, the early internet, but still, for the most part, we had a dumb terminal connecting to a smart mainframe. Then we evolved and we had microcomputers. And what the microcomputer does, also referred to as a personal PC, is it puts the processing and the storage right on your desktop. And that meant that you didn't have to go to the computing center. You could actually do computing and processing. You could store files on your desktop, on your office, at home, wherever you might be. And of course, laptops came out, so we were transportable. And of course, we now have smartphones where we have tons of computing power right in the palm of our hands. Now, the downside of that, of course, is that that meant resources were distributed all across my organization. So a model evolved from that called the client-server model, where dedicated servers were used to store information like shared files, a file server, or email servers in order to control email within my organization. And then those all became connected through the internet. So we wound up with a global network or through a wide area network where I could connect different parts of my organization or just on premise as a local area network. The point here being is that that second wave was a client server scenario where we had distributed processing power, distributed services, and we would then consolidate those in a server client model. Now the cloud kind of takes the best of both of these worlds. How did the cloud even begin? Well, take a company like Amazon, who offers Amazon Web Services. As that company grew, they found that they had more resources than they were currently using, but they built their infrastructure for growth. Then somebody had the bright idea that said, you know what, why don't we connect our resources to the internet, and why don't we allow people to store their files on our infrastructure, so that if they're using multiple devices, they can just use the internet to connect to our infrastructure, and that copy of the file will be available across all their devices. You may be familiar with this if you use a service such as iCloud. If you take a picture on your phone, it automatically appears on your Mac because what's really happened is it's gone from your phone to the Apple Cloud and from the Apple Cloud to your Mac. So what's happening here is you have access to all of your resources, but all of your resources are safe. They're being backed up on the cloud. They're being controlled by you in terms of saying, here's what I want to upload, here's what I want to download. And the very early cloud services really were more about file sharing. Services like Dropbox, services like uh, uh, Microsoft's OneDrive, which used to be called SkyDrive. So you can see that that was the birth of the cloud. Well, of course, these data centers have evolved vastly. So what's happening is we now have Amazon Web Services, which offers a whole host of different services that you can use Amazon's infrastructure rather than having to build your own. Microsoft's Azure, IBM Cloud, Google Cloud Services, iCloud. These are some of the big providers of these data center services. And what we do is we can take any device, even a low powered device, we can connect up to that infrastructure that's located on a data center that belongs to someone else. And then what we can do is use those services. And this can be pretty extensive. So for example, let's say I have a computer at home. It's a little bit of an older computer and let's say it doesn't have a lot of power. But let's say I want to do some sort of deep analytics or I want to start working with artificial intelligence or machine learning. My computer's processor and storage might not be capable of doing that but I can basically go to the cloud and just rent a portion of Microsoft's infrastructure in order to accomplish those tasks. And this is made possible because of course the pervasiveness of the internet around the world. We have a network of networks that allows us to connect pretty much with any device. 
Obviously, the cloud's not going to be useful for you if you have no internet access, but the cloud is basically infrastructure that belongs to someone else that you can rent on a temporary basis. Maybe the best way to think of it is to think of an example of when you're moving. You, if you're moving, you're moving your house, you have a choice. You could go and buy your own moving van. You purchase the van, it's exactly the van you want. You move all your furniture, you move all your household items, but then you're stuck with a van. You're stuck with the infrastructure. You still have to maintain it. You still have to pay insurance on it. You still have to put gas into the vehicle if you're gonna drive it. Now you could sell that infrastructure, but you're probably gonna lose money on that. And this concept of being able to purchase your own infrastructure and then divest it if you no longer need it is a real obstacle for a lot of companies. If I want to just move one house, I don't want to have to go out and buy an entire moving van. Alternatively, what I could do is I could go and I could rent a moving van. So instead of purchasing my own infrastructure, I could rent the moving van for a period of time, pay a portion of the cost of that vehicle, but then return it and not have to worry about maintaining it not have to worry about uh, putting gas in it, buying insurance. So the rental of it would be a lower cost for me for that time period than going out and buying it all myself. Plus, if I find that the moving van that I rent is not quite big enough, I can go back to the rental company and say I need a bigger van or a smaller van. I can get a, a van that is the size I need for the job that I'm doing. In the world of the cloud, we call this elasticity. The idea that I can scale up and scale down my computing infrastructure on an as-needed basis in order to accomplish the tasks that I need to accomplish. And this is the real power of the cloud. I can select what I want to use, how much I want to use it, how long I want to use it, and I can scale up and scale down my needs on an as-needed basis. And this becomes a wonderful thing for things like a system developer. Let's say I want to start a new service. One of the big obstacles that we had if we wanted to start any type of IT company in the past is that I had to have a certain amount of money just to buy an initial infrastructure just to do things like proof of concept. With services like Amazon Web Services, Azure, all of them, IBM, I can go and I can purchase just as much bandwidth as I need, just as much computing power as I need, and if I only have 10 or 11 customers for my product, I don't have to purchase an entire infrastructure that's capable of serving thousands of customers just on the chance that I'll grow. And if I do grow, then what I can do is I can simply scale up my operations in the cloud on an as-needed basis. And if I find that I have a seasonal business where during certain seasons I don't need as much power, I can scale that back. You can't do that if you purchase your own infrastructure. You're stuck with whatever you bought, whether it meets your needs or whether it over exceeds capacity. So that's a huge benefit of the cloud right there as well. Now the cloud can be seen as being divided into different types of services. There are many, many, many services on the cloud, everything from storage to artificial intelligence, machine learning, internet of things, data analytics, there's so many out there. However, we can sort of break these into three rough categories. The first category is one that most people are familiar with. It's SaaS or software as a service. These are things like Google Docs or Microsoft Office 365, Microsoft 365, and what they allow us to do is run applications from the cloud. We don't have to install anything on our computers. We don't have to uh, make sure that we meet the hardware requirements. We don't have to make sure that we have all sorts of specifications in terms of enough processing power or enough storage space. We simply connect through a web interface to those services and start creating documents start creating presentations, doing whatever that we might need to do. Now, those are very useful. Now, some applications don't lend themselves very well to this. Everybody says, well, what about video games? There are some attempts to do some video games in the cloud, but that's an example. You can check out another video here on the channel where I talk about some reasons not to use the cloud. But generally speaking, software as a service has evolved and we can do many things all the way from personal productivity applications all the way up to things like customer relationship management, Salesforce, and uh, even website design. We can go in and we can build off-the-shelf websites very easy without having to do any of the back-end coding. But what if you do want to do some of the back-end coding? What if you want to use things in the cloud, but you want to write the software yourself, or you want to configure it in a unique way? Well, that's the second type of cloud service we have. It's called Platform as a Service. And a classic example of this might be something like a database. Maybe you're writing an application and you need a place to store the data. 
maybe that data is going to be accessed across the globe and you want to have the cloud service provide geo redundancy you want to be able to scale up and scale down your data needs on it as you need that and you can do that through platform as a service in this case what you'll do is you'll have a little bit more control over the back end the configuration of the database those types of things and then what you'll do is you'll write the front end so in this case, you control quite a lot of the infrastructure, not the infrastructure, you control quite a lot of the platform, and then the cloud provider provides all of the infrastructure, backup, redundancy, and so on. But what about if you want to control the infrastructure? That's called Infrastructure as a Service, or IaaS. Now, in this case, you're really going to the cloud provider, they're providing the resources, but you're configuring the infrastructure around those resources. In this case, you're responsible for things like managing how and when things are backed up, doing things like network configurations on virtual networks, and much more of the architecture, but with a great deal, deal of control. So we have software as a service. You don't have a lot of control of what's happening in the background, but you don't care. You're just using the software. Platform as a service. You have a lot of control over the specific platform, such as a database or an email server, but you don't really have to worry about the infrastructure and infrastructure as a service where you adopt much more of the responsibility, but you get to run it on other people's equipment, the cloud provider, and have a lot of control over how things work. Now, there are some new things coming out as well. For example, Windows 365 offers desktop as a service where you can use the cloud to connect to an entire operating system that's running in the cloud. And we're seeing more and more services being offered by cloud providers as time goes on. Everything from simple consumer level photo protection. So every photo you take is loaded up to say Apple's iCloud and you don't have to worry if your computer gets lost or if something happens to your iPhone, all your photos of your family are safe. And I know this was a big concern in the past. I spent a lot of time when I was an Apple consultant setting up individuals so that they wouldn't lose their photos. With the advent of the cloud, that's no longer something you need to do. You can simply have the photos load up to iCloud, and if anything happens to their computer, they just get a new computer, log into their iCloud account, and life is good. Now, I would be remiss if I said the cloud's perfect. There are some concerns that people have with the cloud, and a good example of this is people think that these cloud companies are going to read your data or somehow act in a nefarious way. I think that's being a little bit paranoid and if you're very, very concerned about this, for example, if you were a government agency or if you had highly sensitive data, there are two things. One, the cloud providers have separate cloud services for the government and two, you can use things such as encryption. But for the average consumer, what we can do is we can look and say to ourselves, who's going to be better able to secure my data? Myself, without the computer expertise to set up security and configuration? or a dedicated team of 24 by 7 by 365 professionals that are always there, always monitoring, and always looking for threats and attacks against my data. I'm a pretty big fan of using cloud services because it allows even the smallest of companies to have access to a data center that is worth millions upon millions of dollars. I'm not using the entire data center, I'm just using a slice of it, but I can access the same services as a large enterprise company that used to have to build their own infrastructure on premise. What we're seeing right now is a lot of hybrid cloud, where we're seeing a lot of these enterprise companies have some services on their premise and some services in the cloud, and as the servers start to reach their end of life, what they're doing is they're doing what's called a lift and shift where they're taking their server that used to be on premise and they're putting the exact same thing into the cloud. This is really where infrastructure as a service comes into play because it's quite easy to do with infrastructure as a service. Other companies are being, as they say, born in the cloud. They're actually building their company around a value proposition that doesn't include them being an IT company. They may, for example, be a company that wants to provide some local service and they can just simply use software that's available in the cloud or they can use the platform of the cloud to develop their own software. I have a number of clients that have gone completely to the cloud and if they open up a new location, it takes literally anywhere from half a day to maybe a day to get them completely up and running. I'm using the cloud quite a bit for data analytics and in education where I can have centralized resources and developing different types of technical applications to support different learning outcomes. It's very interesting and there's a great deal of opportunity to be had within this new cloud world that we're living in. So comment down below, ask questions, and I'll even make more videos on this subject if there's an interest from you guys. Thanks again.